Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, Barry Lynn, and uh, I'm the executive director of the Open Markets Institute in Washington. Over the next three days, we'll be hosting a conference busting the big myths in anti-monopoly reform. Today's conversation will address the question, is anti-monopoly reform bad for national security? Tomorrow's discussion, which will be keynoted by White House Special Assistant Tim Wu, will address the question, is anti-monopoly reform bad for innovation and independent business? And Thursday's discussion, which will be keynoted by the Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust, Jonathan Cantor, will look at the question, is anti-monopoly reform bad for consumer privacy and consumer prices? I am really excited by today's first, uh, the first event today. You know, we're gonna start with a discussion between Senator Amy Klobuchar, General Wesley Clark, and Financial Times columnist and author Rana Faruhar. And then we're gonna continue with a panel discussion to unpack these issues. It's now my great honor to introduce Senator Klobuchar and General Clark. Last March, Senator Klobuchar invited me to testify before the Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust in the Senate. At the beginning of that day, the Senator spoke about how, while campaigning for president in 2020, she had become radicalized about the threats that concentrated private power poses to American democracy. Three weeks ago, the Judiciary Committee of the Senate voted 16 to 6 on a strong bipartisan basis to support Senator Klobuchar's first big effort to address these threats, the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. Add these two stories together and you get a perfect sense of who Senator Klobuchar is. Senator Klobuchar understands the true threats to American democracy, prosperity, and national security. Then she takes her anger and channels it into educating her Democratic and Republican allies, her Democratic and Republican friends, in order to lead them to real action. Senator Klobuchar is a true hero in this anti-monopoly movement. So too is General Wesley Clark. General Clark's resume is one of the most distinguished in America today. He is a retired four-star general of the U.S. Army, where he last served as Supreme Allied Commander Europe. General Clark is the author of Waging Modern War and Winning Modern Wars. General Clark is also a successful businessman and consultant. And most important for to us today, General Clark is someone who fully understands the many dangers posed by concentrated economic Power, be it within the supply chains on which we depend for vital goods or the online systems that serve as the basis for all modern mass communications and political engagement. And like Senator Klobuchar, General Clark is someone who knows how to deal with a threat. Finally, it's a true pleasure to introduce Rana Faruhar, who will help guide today's discussion. Ron is, a global business, is the global business columnist and an associate editor at the Financial Times. She's also author of three books, Makers and Takers, Don't Be Evil, and later this year, The Homecoming. Ron is one of the very few journalists working today who fully understands how monopolization has destabilized our international production, trading, and communication systems in ways that make us all far less safe. Ron is also a dear friend. So I am going to now turn it over to Rana, and I uh, hope that everybody has arrived. I think we're all here. Uh, the senator's with us, the general's with us. Thank yes. you, Gary, so much for this. It's a, a, a pleasure and a real honor to be here for this conversation. Um, I know time is limited, so I'm just going to jump right in and, and start with you, Senator. You have been as Barry said, just a pioneer and a real force to be reckoned with on these issues. Um, thinking about anti-monopoly reform, there are so many lenses that we can look at. One of the arguments that's been put forward is that, that this is somehow bad for national security, that we need to let the big stay big in order to battle China in a great power conflict. Um, I disagree with that. I know you disagree with that, but maybe you can help us lay out some of the key points. Sure. Well, thank you, Rana. And it is just an honor uh, to be on with Barry and uh, General Clark. Hello. Good to see you again. Um, and I think well, just to step back a little uh, over the last several months, I think two things have become very clear. One, 
Uh, there is real bipartisan momentum to put forward basic rules of the road for tech. You saw that in the two bills that recently emerged from the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is the first time since the advent of the Internet that we passed any competition bills to send them to the floor of the U.S. Senate. The second thing, which gets to your question, um, is that big tech companies and their lobbyists are willing to say anything and do anything to stall our efforts to do so. In fact, spending $70 million uh, just last year, uh, which doesn't even include uh, the ads. And I try to remind my colleagues of that all the time um, when they hear stories and other things about these bills. Um, I'm going to focus um, in a minute on your question, but I did want to make clear what we're dealing with, uh, that we've had, um, uh, we have big tech titans functioning as gatekeepers, uh, Google with over 90% of the search market um, offering, which they didn't do at the beginning, but now we're seeing them do services that directly compete uh, with other companies, whether it's Yelp or Kayak, uh, Roku, uh, not to mention countless other small businesses and startups. And, you know, I don't um, want to get rid of Google. I don't want to get rid of Facebook. I don't want to get rid of Apple. I've got their phone right here. Um, <laughs> but I think we all know that simply putting some rules of the road in um, will actually increase competition and make for the next Google. And it's how our country has created such a strong economy uh, by stepping in and rejuvenating capitalism. Um, and so that is exactly what we're talking about with these bills. Uh, because I don't think that they need to charge up to 30% tax on competing app developers, uh, which is basically what the charge is. Um, and I don't think they should be putting their own stuff in front of other people's competing products um, on their uh, search engines. And I don't think they should be copying products, uh, as recently happened with Amazon, uh, with a luggage organizer from a four-person firm and they make a one that looks like it and puts it on Amazon Basics. So that's why we did this bill. That's why we have the broad support, which was my point one, um, with people like, uh, I think Samantha B called it the Ocean's Eleven of co-sponsors, uh, from Durbin <laughs> to Graham to Maisie Hirono to John Kennedy to um, Mark Warner, and of course, uh, my co-sponsor, Senator Grassley. So that's why we're doing it. And you asked about... Uh, national security. Um, right now, uh, tech lobbyists are running around the Capitol uh, telling anyone who will listen uh, that big tech's unchecked power is necessary to keep American competitive. And uh, the truth is that our bill is about promoting competition. Um, we have made a number of changes um, to the bill uh, over time um, that would actually um, get at some of their concerns and some of the issues that they have raised. We've made those changes um, both from the House version and also um, in the market. Um, and um, the bill will actually, in my mind, allow for global competitiveness. And um, to me, that is really good for American security. In the worms of FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler, America's digital competition with China should begin with meaningful competition at home and the all-American reality that competition drives innovation. Um, so that's where I'm coming from on that front. Um, and I've had to bat a lot of things away from people claiming that agencies were against this bill, um, which I never have seen proof of that, a government agencies, something that came up. Um, and um, and all I've been able to find are former <laughs> security people who are on the payroll of the company. So I think that's why it's really helpful to have uh, General Clark um, with us today to kind of get at some of this. Uh, but when you look back through history, what's made Americans strong and secure is a strong and secure economy, which means a competitive economy that isn't just dominated by um, by uh, a few major companies, which is what we have going on right now um, with these platforms. So, so let me ask you one quick follow up before we we bring in the general. Um, you know, you're you're making a very important point about a fair and free market uh, market access. There's a lot of academic research actually to show that innovation, cutting edge innovation, particularly in the most strategic sectors 
tends to come from smaller companies, newer companies, from individual academics. Um, innovation actually decreases as companies get bigger and per, certainly after they go public because of market pressures. What, what, you know, what do we need to do to get that out there? And, and maybe you could talk about the ways in which this bill could, um, could help with that narrative. Sure. So um, I think some of the best examples, when you think about all of the issues with privacy, the Facebook whistleblower and the like, one of the ways I describe it um, is that, well, I may as well quote Mark Zuckerberg uh, when he said it in an email, oh, we'd ra- I, we'd, I'd rather buy than compete. Um, and so when you look at some of these acquisitions and the consolidation that's gone on, we will. it's not just about prices, although that can be some of it depending on the marketplace. Um, but it's also about what bells and whistles could have been developed to protect privacy or security. You look at um, WhatsApp and Instagram, you know, we are never going to know uh, what bells and whistles they could have developed on their own um, if they were actually competing uh, with Facebook. We don't know because he bought them. Um, I think the other thing he said in an email is their brands may be nascent, um, but and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it in front of me, they could be disruptive to us. You know, Mm. that's supposed to be tech, right? It's supposed to be disruptive. Capitalism is supposed to be disruptive. That's how you lead, it leads you to products um, that will be more protective of security. And we also know from Apple's move, which I supported, uh, where they actually gave uh, customers a choice on if they wanted to have their data private or not, Uh, We know that the vast majority of the customers chose to have uh, their data private. Um, And so in our bill, by the way, uh, we also make clear that platforms don't need to share data uh, with companies that have been identified as national security risks. We put um, all kinds of changes that data does not need to be shared uh, with the government of any foreign adversary. Uh, including China. Um, And so we've put a bunch of things in to get at some of their concerns. But the bottom line is, and I keep telling my colleagues this, they're not going to be happy until this bill turns into something that would say, like, we're going to study this. Well, I am... (laughs) I think we've studied it. There's plenty. I am tired of this. I think we know that answer. And that's why we're keeping this strong while being pragmatic about, you know, making pragmatic changes. That's how legislation is supposed to work. Um, And so I'm hoping that with the momentum that we're gaining, uh, that it'll be a different story. But I'm glad you raised that because we have a bunch of startups, of course, supporting this bill. Mm -hmm. But actually, competition breeds not just better prices, competition also breeds better services. And better services means choices that are better protect your own data and thus protect our security. Yeah, yeah, and I like connecting the dots between um, privacy, security, and competition. Um, General, let me bring you in. The senator is making an interesting point about how the big get bigger and then they buy up the competitors. This is a nice pivot um, to a kind of a newsworthy announcement from the DOD today. There was a, a white paper that came out arguing that M&A is actually a threat in some cases to national security, which gets right at this issue of competition and national security. You know, you, you've you seen this issue for decades. Tell us where we are and, and how we got here. You know, thank you. First of all, I want to say what an honor it is to be in this forum, and especially with you, Senator. And um, I very much admire your perspective on this and this bill and your efforts on tiring efforts to help us get our economy back on track. I've watched this... Uh, I've been with more than 100 businesses. I taught economics at West Point as a as a captain in the Army. I followed it. I was in OMB as a White House fellow. So I've always watched the economy. I'm an investment banker today. I have my own investment bank, but I've also been with some of the biggest banks. And I've seen the consolidation in the American economy right here in my hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas. And you have to get the balance right in this economy. We had the balance wrong at the turn of the 20th century. And it took the trust busting to open up the economy. We opened up the telecom industry back in the late 1980s, and we had an explosion of innovation. Um, And uh, I've seen the closing of the economy in in the Defense Department. I've seen it in biotechnology, where big oil firms would buy up biotech and then shut it down. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the most dynamic sector of the economy in the last 25 years has been has been what we call the tech sector. So this is a, a heart of America, American innovation. I've looked at this bill that Senator Klobuchar has proposed. It's a very modest proposal. I know it's very controversial because 
these tech companies don't want anybody to touch them. This is modest. People have talked about breaking up the companies. They've talked about treating them as utilities. I think the company should be very supportive of this bill because it really does try to get the balance right. There's an advantage in scale, but we have to balance that off against innovation. In the Defense Department, as you mentioned the question, we've gone from 40 some odd uh, major uh, suppliers really to only five. And although we try to say there are small business set asides in the defense sector, that doesn't work very well. And uh, we, we do know that it's really hard to get innovation going in the defense business. You have to have the support of one of these five major firms to really get much done. I've watched DARPA's efforts, and they're so wonderful, the things that they support, but so many of them never get adopted. Mm. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just a problem. We need to be innovative. That's what's made America great. So I, I really like the bill that Senator Klobuchar has proposed. I think it's a step in the right direction. Let me let me bring both of you. Yeah, sorry, Senator, go ahead. Yeah, if you uh, would mind if I could ask a question of uh, General Clark myself. Yeah, so, please. you know, um, one of the things that companies have been blanketing the hallways with, um, which they, they kind of figure out the things that will most get to uh, the senators, um, is that somehow this would put – um, uh, the U.S. at a disadvantage uh, when competing uh, with other firms. And, you know, we made very, we took a lot of care to make changes to uh, the bill. And we actually, the way we introduced it, that it would apply to anyone doing business in the U.S., not just U.S. firms, uh, when they were at a certain market level. And we even extended that to uh, private companies. So um, could you... Um, dive in on that a little bit about the importance of competition to uh, security and the like, and this argument that somehow um, that this would mess us up uh, with the rest of the world when they're doing business, by the way, in every single country in the world, many of which are putting in place these laws as is happening right now in Europe. Right. But That's a great point too. Yeah. Go ahead, General. Yeah. I like to make my own points in my questions, General. It's like a Senate, but, you know, <laughs> So, I may as well say it myself, but go ahead, go ahead. So, Senator, I don't, I don't see that much logic in what these firms are saying. First of all, these firms are doing business with a lot of com- countries that we have serious issues with, and we know they're making compromises, and they're allowing some of these uh, countries access to uh, software, to servers, and other things that actually they seem to pose a threat. Secondly, uh, if you look at the results of election interference, for example, uh, and and disinformation, what that means to the economy. We need some innovative answers to that. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I see that small firms uh, offer an opportunity if they can get a traction in the marketplace, if they can get the financing to get over that so-called uh, that that so-called gap between having the idea and then having revenue-producing businesses. If they can get through that, we'll have a stronger, more balanced economy. I am worried because. When a firm gets to a certain scale and it's so big and it sees itself as beyond American, and I hate to sound like an old-fashioned patriot, but, you know, during the Cold War, American firms represented American values. We got so complacent during the 1990s that we thought the whole world had our values. Well, it's very clear the whole world doesn't have our values. And so our American firms should support our values of competition of uh, of supporting the United States, of being against uh, the kind of uh, uh, closed societies that we see overseas. So I think we've got to get balance in this marketplace, in the technology space. I don't see it as national security. I see it an asset, uh, um, a boost to national security from your bill, Senator. I, I want to amplify, actually, that's a very important point that you're making, General. Um, you know, we're living in a one world, two systems paradigm. Uh, China is going its own way. In fact, China has made it very clear that it wants to ring fence its own economy, explicitly preference its own its own players. Um, you know, it's advocated for export controls. Um, lots of things that are certainly not by the WTO book. Um, at the same time, as the senator just mentioned, um, and, and as you, you both have said, You've got big U.S.-based multinationals that are American companies and yet also operating in China. How do we, particularly after the last two years, in the wake of all the supply chain disruptions, um, you know, the kind of 
um, scrim being lifted up on vulnerability in the food supply and PPE. How do we think about this now? How should we think about the role of American companies in antitrust policy and national competition? Well, I think it's been going to be a slow and, and grinding process to sort of dial back the globalist instinct that emerged during the 1990s, where we assumed that everybody had the same values and it was all about efficiency and, and lowest cost. It clearly isn't. We're moving into an era of ideological confrontation. Let's say what the administration says is democracy versus autocracy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and our economies have to adjust. Um, you know, we do this routinely in the American economy. We've subsidized homeowners for years. We believe, you know, buying a home is the greatest thing. That's why there's a mortgage interest deduction. And it's untouchable. It's like the third rail in <laughs> politics when you're touching it. It's like Social Security. Don't touch my mortgage interest deduction. That's because, you know, we have fed consciously the real estate market as an engine of American capitalism and growth and economic development. OK, so government has to take the right steps to help the private economy adapt to the global situation. That's all it is. Government does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Every business wants to get bigger. Every business wants to eliminate the competition. I mean, every business I've been associated with wants that rent that comes from being the sole provider of a service. And yet the economy, the American people and our way of life benefit from that competition. So we have to get the balance right. That's the way I see this. And this will be the first, I think, of many other steps that will follow, depending on how the Ukraine situation works out, depending on how China evolves. But we're going to have to re reinvest in American entrepreneurship, American manufacturing, and American creativity here at home. We mm. can't simply go for the lowest cost labor. Of yeah. Our. yeah. Rana, if I could, if I could just add to, I um, enjoyed um, this analogy of how um, increasing competition um, is good for our supply chain, right? We want more different companies making things so we don't get reliant on just one. As we learned with some of the agriculture issues during the pandemic, if one plant shut down and there was no other plant to go to, right? You want to have um, competition is what um, General Clark is saying here. And when I look at the supply chain thing, I think, okay, one, we've learned we want to have more stuff made here. OK, and the way you do that is competitive markets and investment. Um, the second thing that we know is the solutions that are things like shipping and making our ports work better and investing in that infrastructure. It is actually I keep running into antitrust, Barry, everywhere I go. Um, the shipping industry has become incredibly consolidated. And guess what, General? They have an exemption from the antitrust laws. The vast majority of them are international um, um, conglomerates that have an, have an exemption, are not American companies, aren't flying American flags on the seas, and yet are sort of picking and choosing um, which containers uh, they are shipping. And I actually got Senator Thune to do a bill with me um, and this because we've had so much problem in the Midwest with shipping delays, which hurts one higher consumer rates, duh, uh, because they're the shipping companies made three to four times uh, what they were making in the past, depending on the company, the general I think averages two to three times when the money came out on the backs of American customers while we're seeing delay in shipping. And part of that is all because there's consolidation in the industry. So it is by far not the only reason we're seeing inflation. It's workforce shortage. It's, you know, as we mentioned, supply chain things related to the pandemic, a number of things. Um, but, but to just close our eyes um, to this idea that um, um, that supply chain is unrelated to uh, consolidation um, is wrong. Supply chain problems are related to consolidation. Just in the last five minutes we have left, let me ask you all to kind of draw out something that I think has been um, implicit in the conversation, but let's make it explicit, which is the connection between competition and liberal democracy. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the issues um, with competition with China, but also the problems that come from having too much concentration with companies in the U.S. Um, we're talking about disinformation. Um, you know, connect the dots for us. General, how do you see the link between strong competition policy and protection of liberal, liberal democracy? First of all, I'd like to see the money out of politics. So we've got a lot of work to do in this country 
to return it to a more secure democratic form. Dark money, these PACs, the way that uh, we can bring foreign money in through U.S. subsidiaries, there's so many things wrong. But if you have more firms out there and more competition, you have more than sources of people who are going to the Congress who get a greater diversity of ideas. People in, in business, they do go to Congress. They do look for support. Mm -hmm. They do try to head off. That's fine. We need that because Congress needs that, those sorts of information. But when you're only hearing one voice, you're not getting the kind of information you need to make good legislation. That's the way I see it as a former uh, you know, teacher of economics and political <laughs> science. And I defer to the she's the expert. No, Just I mean, Senator, I think- last, last words to you. Of course, I, I, I love that analogy because you wanna hear all sides. And I've, I, by the way, came out of the private sector, worked in the private sector, representing companies for over a decade. And so that's my perspective. I like to hear the business perspective, but when you have it so imbalanced, as the general said, when you have major dominant platforms that are spending in the top five of lobbying year after year after year, and you have over a thousand lobbyists running around around every corner you turn, people thinking their cool friend is writing them with some new ideas, which just happen to be talking points because they're on the payroll of a company, uh, which is stories I've heard around the hill, you've got a problem. And I would note that our, to get the last word in, our country started because we had a bunch of people come over to America uh, who said, you know what, we want to have independent spirit. We want to be able to have freedom of religion, a freedom to start our own country, a freedom of our politics and ideologies. And we want to have a freedom to be entrepreneurs. There was this huge strain of thought uh, through the um, uh, original founders of our country that they didn't want to buy their tea from one monopoly tea company, the East Indies Tea Company. Um, and in fact, the Boston Tea Party wasn't just about taxation without representation. It was also about a monopoly. And over time, in those first hundred years of our country, didn't get all settled by the Constitution. <laughs> the one founding father said to the other, oh, the Congress will take care of it. Okay, that took a hundred years. Um, but the point is that eventually they did with the Sherman Act and then the Clayton Act. And my argument is that every 20, 30, 40 years, we rejuvenate our competition policy and we do something to get at the moments of the day. We haven't done one thing, nothing, zero, nada, when it comes to the tech center. And yet the some est estimates are that it is nearly 20% of our economy. We haven't passed one bill on privacy federally. Mm -hmm. Come on. We haven't done anything uh, when it comes to competition policy. So this idea, as the general pointed out, that this is somehow inconsistent with the American way, uh, history shows us uh, that it is dead wrong and that this is consistent uh, with the American way, no matter who's in charge, Democrats or Republicans, which is why you're seeing such bipartisan support, including through two administrations that were very different in many different ways. Um, yeah, well, that's for sure. You know, you're bringing up an important point, too, that I think the rest of the world is watching to see what happens in the U.S. And, and this is we're out of time, but we, you know, we should also stress the importance of the U.S. and the EU working together um, on these issues. I, I, as somebody that covers Europe a lot, I see a lot uh, of folks in Brussels watching carefully to to see if America is willing to curb its largest firms and 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 curb elites, uh, you know, and 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 uh, represent its best values. Anyway, and, let me stop. And they're going to go ahead regardless of what we do. So, yeah. you know, the fact that we could do this. In, court, in some coordinated effort is actually a really, really smart thing. Um, yeah. And I think your last words, you had the last words, we're out of time, because that actually also is a good way of saying we're out of time when it comes to tech. So thank you. Very good. Well, thank you both. Um, General Senator, pleasure and an honor. Barry, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be on with you, Senator. Congratulations on the bill. Thank you. Well, that was a terrific start to this conference, and it was a real an honor to have the senator and the general uh, with us today. And uh, I think it, that conversation ended on a really impo fundamentally important note, which is that, uh, as the senator said, it is vital that we work together with the Europeans and our other allies to deal with these grave threats to our democracy. Um, so I uh, wanted to uh, 
thank also Rana for being a wonderful sort of interlocutor in that last discussion. And I'm also going to now turn it over to the person who's going to run the next discussion. And, and as part of this, um, Rana is going to put on a different hat and actually become uh, uh, a an expert, uh, and uh, which is, uh, and she is one of the premier experts, as I noted, in sort of the intersection between uh, power and political well-being in in America and around the world today. So the person who is uh, going to run this next panel is a uh, fellow named David Salamini. He is the director of strategic communications at the Stimson Center. He brings more than 15 years of experience in policy and persuasion to national security and foreign affairs issues. He has worked extensively uh, with nonprofits and helping them to understand national security issues. And he has created and hosted The Secure Line, a podcast on policy and politics, uh, the politics of America's role in the world. Previously, uh, David was at the Truman National Security Project, and he served as a speechwriter for a Virginia gubernatorial campaign. So, and then David is going to introduce also as uh, our next uh, two uh, participants, which is Dr. Richard Andres and Rose Jackson. Well, thank okay. you, Barry, and of course, the Senator and General uh, for the discussion and Rana for leading it. I'm excited to continue this conversation about the impact of the big platform companies on American national security, can confront the claims about greater competition, uh, the idea that it would cause any harm. And this is a topic with a ton of angles and areas, and I think we could probably do this for four hours instead of 40 minutes. But we will do our best to keep things snappy um, and kind of move through uh, move through our questions in a row. And we have a stellar group of experts with a wide variety of experience and expertise uh, to, to help us do that. First, uh, I want to introduce Rose Jackson. Now, Rose directs the Democracy and Tech Initiative at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. She is a former entrepreneur, a former diplomat, having both led a company focused on making it easier for people to engage in public life, as well as serving as Chief of Staff in the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. I also want to thank Rose for joining us while she is on vacation. Uh, thank you, Rose, so much. We're also joined by Dr. Richard Andres, a professor of national security strategy at the National War College, where he teaches, among other things, strategy development and cyber strategy and policy. He has a long history of advising some very senior government leaders, including, I want to say, the then dual-hatted NSA head and head of cyber command. And he also had the distinct uh, misfortune of having me in his uh, class on cyber policy uh, in grad school. And uh, lastly, uh, obviously, we have Rana Fruhart, who will stay with us as uh, as a panelist, as Barry mentioned. Um, I want to call out the, the full title of uh, her most recent book, which, as Barry mentioned, is Don't Be Evil, How P Big Tech Betrayed Its Founding Principles and All of Us. And I think that is going to give us uh, some insight into where some of uh, some of her views will be. But I want to um, I want to dive in uh, first, if nothing else, with the discussion of, of the stakes, the downside risk of how important is it from a uh, for Americans if we get this area of policy wrong. And for that, I want to start with Rose Jackson. So Rose, if you could help us understand the consequences for American leadership as a voice for a set of liberal or internationalist values in the world, if we get tech policy wrong, right? how, does, how does the question of how we govern tech and internet uh, connect with our ability to lead on the world stage? Thanks, David. That's an important question uh, for this conversation. And I think uh, at the risk of sounding overly dramatic, I think the survival of universal rights as a concept and guarantees that we all rely on in the world depends on us getting governance of technology right. And the stakes are complicated as well as being high because the internet in the digital world is systemic. There's not really a version where there can be an American internet and a French internet and a Chinese internet. There's, there's one digital world. And we're not competing uh, in a space absent people very intentionally trying to shape that world. You have countries like China and Russia that have an interest in ensuring that the digital world uh, is friendly to an authoritarian approach and allows for state control. And they are leveraging their power in international fora, their industrial strategies, their commercial strategies, their geopolitical approaches, all to drive forward an internet that is not compatible with the rights that we expect offline. 
At the same time, American allies are really suffering for the absence of, of our clarity on these issues. We don't have privacy protections in the US. We're having this fight right now about whether or not we should have uh, competition in an American economy. And in the midst of that confusion, the United States isn't really showing up in the international conversation. And so our allies are in good faith trying to figure out how to approach this. And you have the Digital Services Act in Europe and the Digital Markets Act. You also have bills in the UK, in Canada and Australia that are all taking very different approaches. Some of them are, are not as democratic as we might want. And so I think the, the stakes really are whether or not the United States has a leadership role, as well as whether or not democracy and human rights really have viability in the long term. Uh, they couldn't possibly be higher. So Rana, I want to take that same basic question and um, ask it in the context of international competition. I think no one on this call would disagree that the U.S.-China strategic relationship competition um, is likely to be the most important international question of the next 50 or more years. The general sen and the senator both made very compelling cases about competition increasing our security. F from the perspective of international economic power, what does a world look like where China, instead of the U.S., is the greater technology innovator? Um, well, it's a very uncomfortable world for the U.S. and, and for many other countries, um, Europe certainly. I was struck by something the general said, which um, was that the 90s, in the 90s, there was a bit of willful blindness, I think, um, to, to the fact that China was not going to get freer as it got richer. Um, you know, we, we thought that for a while. I think as somebody that's been going over to China for 20 years now, I, you know, it's it's been pretty obvious to me for some time that that was not going to be the case. Um, there is a different political economy there. It works well for the Chinese. It would not work well for the U.S. or Europe. And we're in the middle of a major transition. I mean, I think um, it, it's not too much to say that we're probably at the end of the first part of what is an industrial revolution type transformation. We've uh, seen the rise of the consumer internet um, that has created a handful of large uh, US tech giants. It's also created a Chinese surveillance state. And so you have sort of two uh, different, but in some ways equal concentrations of power duking it out. Uh, neither of those systems are, are great for individuals, for small companies, and I would argue for liberal democracy. So I think it's very important right now that the US and other liberal democracies, Europe in particular, come together and think, what kind of economy do we want to have? What should the rules of the road look like? I mean, you know, um, my friend Joe Stiglitz, the economist, often says uh, capitalism is the rules are not handed down on stone tablets. We can shape them. We are in a major shaping period right now. And it's, I mean, the next two to three years are incredibly important, I think, in, in getting this right. And antitrust is right at the heart of that. Thank you. And I want to then um, take that kind of the next step, uh, to Richard, uh, you know, help us take these views from, you know, kind of the 100,000 foot kind of view from orbit down to the level of a senior policymaker. You know, do the consequences discuss, you know, does that resonate with you as someone who has sat next to someone who every day is worried about, you know, a cybersecurity threat landscape? And what are the consequences that worry those national security practitioners if the U.S. has a tech sector either dominated by just a few companies, just one that can't compete overseas? You know, only four or five questions, sir. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So... <clears throat> With, with the Biden administration coming in, one of the things that has has come up is uh, this notion that we're in a, a new a technology cold war. And I think that's that's too strong. It's, it's not a cold war. It's slightly the wrong analogy, but we are in a, a very serious strategic competition with China. And probably <clears throat> technology is the most the most vital thing that we're competing over at this point. And uh, when we when we fought the Soviets in the Cold War, we were able to out tech our way. We were, we were through the first and second offsets. We were, we were able to, to innovate and increase our technology at a rate they couldn't keep up with. Uh, the, the problem now <clears throat> is the things we did then are not working. And they're not working because China has come up with a very innovative information strategy. So it has taken its big companies and turned them over as tools of, of state power. And it uses them almost like, like state departments or institutions. And 
Uh, and it's been very careful to keep us out of their networks. So they have had this capability to reach in to our, our systems, often regularly using our big companies as ways to get inside of our companies and our government. They have a one-way you know, semi-permeable membrane where they can reach in and they steal hundreds of billions of dollars in IP from us every year our companies largely don't do anything about it. The Russians in particular, but the Chinese too, use the semi-permeable memory to reach in and touch our populations, right? They, through social media and other methods, they disrupt Western countries. And again, our companies, which are the only institutions which are in a place to actually stop this sort of foreign intervention in our, our domestic politics, they, they don't do much about it. Not only do they not do much about it, a big part of their their corporate plans are to sell our data, our personal data, which they collect in unlimited amounts, out to brokerage companies, which also sell it to the Chinese, the Russians, Iranians, and everyone else. So we, we've got a problem here, right? This emerging battlefield is mainly big corporations. That's, that's where it is being fought. And the, the Chinese and the Russians, they understand that, and they have come up with legislative policy to best use that emerging battleground. But we have not been able to pass legislation in the United States. Uh, and, and you know, as the Senator mentioned, as General Clark mentioned, there are good reasons for that. And among those are the, the tens of millions of dollars in lobbying money that our big companies spend every year. So I, I throw that out just sort of as some, some starting points to begin a, a conversation. Thanks, David. Absolutely, so um, Rana, I'm gonna ask you to react to that. Um, and then I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about that DOD report released this morning. I believe you're on mute, man. Sorry about that. Um, I think Richard's hitting something really important um, that comes up a lot actually in, in economic policy circles. There's a kind of a narrative that, wow, you know, China's got this amazing sort of top-down state control. They've got it all worked out. They've taken the industrial policy from the U.S. book and perfected it, and these big companies are going to take over the world. And so we need to stay big, too. And we need to have three, four, or five companies running everything in the U.S. Actually, um, and talk to any venture capitalist, uh, talk to any economist, they'll tell you, in fact, it's just the opposite, a decentralization uh, of power is the American competitive advantage. Um, letting a lot of different types of companies uh, really come up and come to fruition and create alternatives is where it's at for America from, um, from a competition standpoint, but also from an economic growth standpoint. Um, and, and we are changing. I mean, the economy right now is going through a major change. You can see it in the resurgence of of labor rights. You can see it in um, the administration's work, not wealth slogan. I mean, these are slow changes, but they're all moving us from a system that had gotten too concentrated and too linear and too focused on um, the share prices of a handful of large companies to something that's more robust and dynamic and diverse. Well, and I think that that, co that basic concept of saying, okay, the Competition is going to get us new ideas. It turns out actually that the small disruptive firm is usually the one with the exciting new idea that solves right. the problem, right? It's the, it's the very classic Silicon Valley way of thinking that, you know, the innovator in the garage is the guy who's going to knock the big guy out of business. Right. And so, um, and just this morning, the Defense, Defense Department released a report on competition in the defense sector. I think you mentioned this uh, during your discussion with the general and uh, the senator calling for, among other things, increased scrutiny of mergers and acquisitions in the defense industrial base, the danger of getting locked into vendors, you know, vendor lock, uh, something from the consumer side, I think we're probably all very familiar with, the need for new entrants in that market, the need for more involvement of small businesses mm -hmm. and the challenges, um, threats to supply chain. And so it, it seems to me that what big tech wants, which is being sheltered for competition, is nearly exactly the opposite of what the <laughs> defense department is telling us that it wants. So um, Ron, if you could just bounce off of that and yeah. then um, I wanna open up for other two. Um, well, that, that's definitely the case. And that's been the case for decades actually. Um, uh, and that makes sense because you know the defense department focuses on resiliency. 
uh, and preparing for worst case scenarios. Business focuses on efficiency. And, um, and I put that in quotation marks because uh, in the US in the context of Anglo-American capitalism for the last 40 years, that's essentially meant um, making things as cheaply as possible and putting jobs wherever you have to go to do that and, um, and production. And that's why that model actually led us to a place where Taiwan, which is you know perhaps one of the most um, geopolitically contentious places in the world, um, has over 90% of high-end chip production. The chips that go into literally everything important in our lives are being made in one tiny country that may someday be taken over uh, uh, by mainland China. So, you know, is that is that resilient? No. Is it a good business decision? Not really. It looked great on paper at a time when nothing else was going wrong. But even stepping back from geopolitics, there are a lot of things that can go wrong now. We've got climate issues that create tsunamis. We've got um, um, migration uh, challenges. We've got geopolitical problems that have nothing to do with China that are going to continue to um, challenge supply chains. And so I think the DOD report makes a lot of sense just from a, a standpoint of security and safety. So, uh, Professor Andre, so you think about resilience, right? Building layers of defense. Um, how does that concept of resilience and what DOD is saying mesh with your experience? No, the, the report came out this morning. I have not yet read. You haven't it. digested the entire thing front to back yet, <laughs> but but I will. Um, it, it's it's right. It's exactly right. You can't have just a few big companies like this and have resiliency at the same time. And and the other thing is too, the amount of autonomy and control these companies get because they are not responsive to market forces can be. Uh, can be daunting. So what happens if, as occurred a few years ago, um, Google decides it doesn't want to, to play uh, with the Department of Defense, right? It's great. Every company should have the right to, to play or not play with, with the Department of Defense if they want to. But if there are no alternatives out there or a few alternatives, you know, what do you do? We don't have what we need right now, which is market competition in order to allow for a robust defense against both the things that uh, Rana was talking about and, um, and, and the problem of just just having innovative companies out there who we can call upon uh, when we need them. Well, I think that, that strikes me as especially true given how increasingly important data information, sharing information out to do, um, as a DOD loves to term the warfighter, right, is such a central part of running a modern military and managing a modern um, competition. Um, and uh, Professor, there's one specific claim I want to I want to get your reaction to. The um, industry trade group, the Computer and Communications Industry Association, uh, they've often made the case that the sheer size of these tech companies actually means they have kind of a, a commensurate depth of understanding of the cyber threat landscape. And if they were smaller, you know, broken up, there were more competi- competitors, so that they'd be less able to identify threats, share them with the U.S. government. But I mean, you've been an advisor to senior folks in you know, Cyber Command. How does that claim strike you? Does that seem like uh, an accurate way to, 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 to discuss the, the impact of size? Well, it's not foolish, that argument. But uh, the problem is that these big companies are not terribly willing to share their information. They're not, they're not very helpful. Uh, I, I should say they could be a lot more helpful. The, the problem is that these big companies, they don't, you know, they don't primarily see themselves as American companies. So, well, you know, in government, we, we're, we're concerned uh, about helping industry as a whole protect against foreign cyber intrusions. Uh, but the big companies, they see themselves as citizens of the world and not all that concerned with helping American companies, especially if it would irritate the Chinese, right? they're vastly more worried about what the Chinese government thinks and what the U.S. government thinks. You know, and that's because we have a free country. We're not going to come down on big companies, uh, you know, if, if we don't like what they're doing, but the Chinese punishes them uh, regularly if they do things which the Chinese Communist Party views as going against uh, state uh, interest. So, so yeah, that claim, you know, there's, it's, not, it's not silly. There is something to it, but practically, no, it doesn't hold up. It does not make much difference. And I think at the end of the day, we our our system is the U.S. system would be safer if we 
if we had more companies instead of having a few giant companies um, as we do today. And so um, I want, we're going to get to some of the particular uh, items that I think user have mentioned now and other folks have as well in terms of the leverage that China has over um, a number of these companies, the impact of this has on um, technology transfer and um, supply chains. And I want to bang through those um, in a minute. Before we do that, I do want to give Rose just a second to chime in on uh, the topic of the DOD report and how the department is thinking about competition. I, mean, I think it's a great illustration of what it looks like when we have a conversation that is shaped by so much spurious claims that any attempt at regulation is somehow bad for national security versus starting with the question, what is it that is required to protect American national security and national interests? And the Defense Department just put out its own independent answer on that exact question. I think if we were to extend that frame rather than accept the premise that we need to address these tit for tat claims about scale as the only solution for cybersecurity or any number of the other ones we're hearing, we might actually get to the point of addressing what the professor mentioned, which is data brokers that can sell our data collected through any number of places to literally anyone, including China and foreign intelligence services. We might actually get to the question of how we assess investment and control of the very companies that we are articulating form the backbone of how we communicate, how we conduct our democracy, how we exchange in free enterprise and innovation, all of these things that this conversation illustrates is essential to American life and American interests and American presence in the world. And I worry that our, our approaching it just by the definition of defense, uh, I don't mean the defense department, but defending these positions misses what frankly, we should all feel is an urgent need to drive forward a, a major change in how we address the tech sector so that we can have the innovation and the competition that puts us in a good position internationally, but also ensures we have the democracy that we want at home and that we're playing in the world in support of democracies that are trying to survive in the same ways. Um, so I'm excited to see the DOD report, and I hope that we can see more things like that from the U.S. government articulating what our actual interests are. This is why I wanted Rose and was so happy to have Rose in this conversation because I know she'd help us bring up back to the big picture of questions about what are the values at stake. So we have the big tech, big tech saying that the market dominance is a benefit with the DOD saying otherwise. I think we're now in a probably good place to then kind of drill down and talk about the risks that today's big tech firms pose to national security right now. Um, and um, I want to start kind of discuss that view in a couple of lines, but I do want to first and I want to go back directly to Rose because um, I don't want to lose sight of the values points that she's making here. And I think it's fair to presume uh, that China is so going to China, right? They are going to remain an authoritarian state that does horrible things to its own people, that does its best to uh, steal technology, to uh, privilege a certain number of country companies uh, with stolen information. My question is, in what ways does the big tech landscape we have now enable the maintenance of that authoritarian state and the export of that model to other countries? Um, you can, at risk of being too much of the government focus, I don't know that it's, it's you know, all at the feet of quote unquote big tech and companies. I think the whole point of this is it takes government setting the right rules and standards and bringing its power to bear in an international system uh, so that our companies have the incentives to grow and develop in a, in a form that is good and that they then can show up in the world and have a fair shot at competition. Where I think we're missing some of these things is A, China is showing up in the international spaces that set the rules for how the systems operate and who gets satellite slots, what cable gets laid where, what are the rules for the internet itself? That's a big thing that we're kind of missing some of the picture on. Um, the other part of it though is I think competition mindlessly, just the word competition isn't what we're actually talking about. China right now is pushing forward uh, a form of AI and ML innovation built on big data hoovered up from what is best described as genocide in Xinjiang and a surveillance state that feeds its technology. And I think if we unthinkingly try to compete with just AI as some broad concept put forward in that realm, I don't know that we're necessarily driving the kind of innovation that we would want. And so there's both the question of, are we competing with China? Are we competing with other companies? 
But I also think the United States should own proudly the fact that we drive innovation through a set of values and through a set of competition shaped by those rules and norms. We are a democracy that is core to who we are as a country. But on top of that, some of what we've discussed in this entire session about kind of the pride and ethos of American innovation and competition, that is not values neutral. Uh, and so I think sometimes we get a little confused with competition with China and competition itself is an economic value. Um, and so I would just call that out. This isn't a values neutral space to engage in. And I think when we uh, give our companies no choice but to operate in that competitive environment. We're also missing a big part of the picture of how we can incentivize a different kind of innovation uh, here and around the world. You are, you are, I wanna underline the point you're making that technology is not apolitical, uh, that the tools we choose to develop have values that underlie them and the rules we have to encourage or discourage that right, is, um, is foundational. Ron, I saw a lot of nods uh, as Rose was talking, so I wanted to give you a chance uh, to two-finger get in on that point. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I just thought that Rose was really hitting a core issue, which is um, in the age of surveillance capitalism, which we are in, you know, our data is being monitored and monetized um, by many companies, not just the big five platforms. Um, that data has value and it's being harvested and there needs to be a discussion, which the big tech companies are, are doing their best to, to not really have in a constructive way about how should it be used? Um, can it be used for certain things and not for other things? Can a variety of companies, um, nonprofits, individuals <clears throat> get access to that data or is it going to be ring fenced? by the largest players, um, which is, is sort of the definition of monopoly. Um, and that's really about thinking as citizens, not just consumers. And so, you know, one of the things I've been really pleased about actually, and I think Open Markets has done an amazing job pushing forward this notion of and a broader view of antitrust, that this isn't just about consumer pricing, it's about um, a choice, it's about having a diverse and robust economy. And that includes thinking about workers, um, businesses of all sizes, civil society. Um, that's that's crucial here. And you know, that point about the, these are choices that we're making, I think, is is really important because you know, a business deciding that it's going to go into China, into the Chinese market, that is a choice that comes with a number of very serious um, compromises. Um, you know, when a tech firm is permitted to do business in China, I think it's probably common knowledge at this point that they are required to partner with a Chinese company and a joint venture. So, Richard, I want to um, take that one of those this example of a compromise and um, toss it to you. Clearly, that kind of joint venture creates opportunities, as you've mentioned. I want to dig in deeper on intellectual property theft and technology transfer. Um, and also from a cybersecurity perspective, I mean, does it worry someone in your shoes that the code running in, on a server in the hands of a Chinese state-owned enterprise is the same code running data storage for some critical infrastructure agency in the United States? It, it's very worrying. The Chinese are, the, the Chinese perspective, right? The Chinese view on strategy is that information is the key to winning the, the global geo-economic competition that's occurring. And they have, they've been very careful to get the source code from all big organizations that they work with, including Microsoft, right? So right, right to the core, they uh, have the they have the desire. And, and the cyber command commander said a few years ago that the Chinese had inserted malware into uh, our electric grid and could take it down, right? That that comment is is so it's so frightening that I think that people just don't want to think about what that signifies. They have, they they use these relationships that they build with the Microsofts, with whoever is willing to do business with them, to gain access to our most vulnerable um, institutions in the United States, infrastructures and institutions. They do it regularly. There's there's something that uh, that Rana said. I want to I want to. Maybe bring it up and, and move a little beyond it. She talked mm -hmm. about the age of surveillance capitalism and how the Chinese are, for instance, taking advantage of that because our companies sell them the information and provide them the information, or or through mergers, we allow the Chinese companies to work in the United States. Um, but we're moving beyond the age of surveillance capitalism to something that uh, you might call 
grooming capitalism. And that is where these big companies, they don't only take your data and your children's data, but they try to push data at them in order to get them to develop certain belief structures. They're, they're trying to create the next generation of customers. They, they need them not to think or to think in the ways that they want them. It just as a, a little anecdote, I think it's just a little amusing from a, you know, a professor formerly of classical philosophy. When Plato talked about creating the Republic, right? I mean, his idea, the first real political science book ever, he said, the first thing that you do is you need to control the music and the stories. And if you control that, the rest will follow. And that's, you know, you look at whether it's uh, uh, Facebook, whether it's Google, or whether it's TikTok, the institutions that get our children to listen to them, to their music, to their videos, to their stories, will have immense power over the next generation and what happens in the United States and elsewhere. That's that's the new battlefield. It's the grooming capitalism, uh, I would call it. And you have that reminds me of the you know relatively recent uh, Facebook whistleblower allegations um, and one that comes to mind in this context, and this is someone with kids seeing the the way that they were entirely willing to let self-image problems among children fester because it meant they used Instagram more, right? Um, and that, if you're talking about leverage, we have like, we have leverage in this context of, you know, of individuals and of the companies themselves. And so our last couple of minutes, um, I want to touch on leverage. Um, Rana, so let's pretend for a moment you're Apple. You rely on hardware and factories in China to assemble your products. Without that access, you can't make an iPhone. Or you're Amazon. You operate a cloud service, cloud computing services uh, to Chinese customers who make up an increasing share of, of your bottom line. But in China, there's no such thing as an independent judiciary or what we might recognize as free speech or the rule of law. They can shut you down tomorrow and you know it. And we know that China has a history of this activity. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how that changes a company's calculus and what it is willing to or not do. Yeah. Well, um, just take Apple. I mean, this is a company that has made uh, protecting privacy as sort of a competitive marketing strategy in the U.S. Um, Very different rules for how data is used when it's collected in China. And that's down to the Communist Party saying, Um, You know, there is no assumption of privacy here. And if you want to do business in China, that's the deal. Um, You know, I remember actually being in China a few years back talking to a big clean tech company, Western clean tech company um, that was number one in the market and told me that they were going to they were very pleased to know that they were going to be number four in a few years. And I said, well, how do you know you're going to be number four? And they said, well, that's what Beijing has told us, because they were beginning to having taken that IP move into um, backing national champions and edging the Western players out of the market. That's, I mean, that's stated policy. So there's no big mystery here. I think what's interesting, just one more point on leverage, you're seeing China start to use its leverage um, in all kinds of trade negotiations, in supply chain um, issues, you know, what's happening in Lithuania, what's happened with the German auto industry. And they are really, really locked in to what the party wants them to do. And um, this is why uh, transatlantic cooperation uh, and an agreement over what values are, to go back to Rose's point, is so important here um, if we're going to kind of be in the game of the 21st century economy. That point about leverage threatens me in the context of thinking about lobbying, where we have these companies are now spending many millions of dollars. They're worried about doing anything that might anger Chinese leaders and what might jeopardize their access to that market or their supply chain. I don't, I'm not terribly comfortable having those people lobby in Congress, right? And, but that is the world in which, in which we are increasingly living. Uh, Professor Andres, uh, la- one of the last questions to you, I want to ask you to respond to that point about leverage, not just over companies, but that leverage over people, right? These companies know the intimate details of the lives of many millions of people. And in the wrong hands, that seems like, like nightmare fuel for anyone working in counterintelligence at a U.S. intelligence agency or, yeah. So let me let me let you run with that um, scary scenario while I get our next question ready. <laughs> I, I gotta laugh because it's so, it's so frightening. The other alternative was to cry. I don't think most people understand the level of espionage that these friendly companies engage in. So if you're wearing a Fitbit and you're carrying a telephone, uh, 
Google is watching where you go minute by minute, second by second. It's calibrating your heart rate based on the Fitbit on your arm to your location. It's calibrating who is in your vicinity. You also geo tracking to know how you feel when you're around, you know, who you are. When you lit, when you turn on your, your computer, Google immediately, and I just use Google, I could be using Facebook, they're probably worse, is your, your computer immediately is sending cookies off, giving the most intimate details of your searches. Even if you think you're not using Google, right, and you think you're in another browser, Google has planted cookies in that browser so they can look at what you're doing. When you look at your phone, not only are they monitoring where you're going, what you're listening to, what you're watching, they're looking at what, what part of the screen your eyes are lingering on to get an idea about your, your inc inclinations, right? They want to know things about every intimate detail. Uh, and, and again, uh, David, we talked about this some, some years ago, but um, generally speaking, the artificial intelligences they use to predict your preferences and behaviors have proved in the laboratories to be vastly, vastly better at analyzing you than your own spouse or your best friend. So they have that level of information about you. And think about that in terms of a espionage or counter espionage uh, tool for finding recruits, uh, you know, unhappy people, people having uh, uh, extramarital affairs, you name whatever it is, you know, and they sell this information to the Iranians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, whoever wants to buy it, right? So this is a bonanza. So that's the first level. And the second level is, um, you know, just think about this when you, and I'm going to use Google, I could be using any of these things. I have nothing against Google. In fact, I really, really like Google, right? I, I use it all the time, but, but um, if you use Gmail, right, as soon as you signed up for Gmail, you agreed that Google gets to read and keep copies of everything you ever sent, not to mention every text that ever went through your phone or voicemail that went through because they get, you also agreed to give them all of that information. They have that. And if you come out and try to launch a, um, uh, any kind of legislation they don't like, I imagine, I can't see any reason why Google couldn't go back through every email that you've ever written. And if there was anything in there that might compromise you or in any way help their case, I imagine they would feel free about using that, which should be frightening to everyone on this panel and everybody listening in, right? The level of information that potentially could be used to help corporate policy there is, is exquisite. Um, and then finally, uh, think about this. If you are an intellectual, if you are a person who is interested in policy, in anything regarding information technology, um, you have to be very concerned if you ever think about getting a job for a, a big company. And since they control the market now, if you want to go into anything related to search engines or social media, or whatever, um, that if you say anything negative uh, in your think tank, if you say anything negative on a, a podcast or a broadcast like this, could you get a job? And, you know, even if it really doesn't matter and nobody cares, most people in our industry are afraid. And if you talk to people in think tanks, they won't go up and say anything that might be construed as negative by the big four because they're afraid it might affect their career prospects in the future. Maybe not this year, but maybe five or 10 years down the line when they're looking for a job. So, yeah, uh, the potential here that no, no private company should have that much leverage over U.S. politicians and the U.S. think tank community or, or America in general. It's too much power in private hands. I want to close then, I think probably given our given our time, I, um, I'm going to try to sneak in one last question uh, to Rose because the other aspect of this, uh, the size of these companies is their ability to launder disinformation to many, many millions of Americans. So Rose, if you in, you know, minute, maybe two max. Um, you know, I lived through 2016. It seems they've gotten pretty bad. They're not very good at um, uh, stopping the spread of disinformation. You know, the, I'll solve that in, in one minute before we close. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, the challenge of disinformation is the whole of society. There is no single company that could possibly solve it, no government action that could solve it. It genuinely requires everyone. And part of that means that there has to be availability of information um, and awareness of how an ecosystem is operating. And at the core of a lot of what we're talking about is also a question of incentives. We've talked a good deal about data and some of the really problematic realities in the United States, about how easy it is to collect data 
as well as the incentives that company ha companies have to drive you to engage with technology in a way that creates more data so that you can then be influenced to buy things, be influenced to use a platform more so valuations can go up. And the kind of ancillary exhaust of that being everything that we talked about, the dangers of how that data can be used in a number of different directions. Disinformation is absolutely influenced by that systemic nature of our ecosystem. And so as much as it's tempting to want to focus on content itself, uh, at the end of the day, I think I, what seems clear to me from this conversation is we can have as many discussions as we want about quote unquote, the threat of China. But everything we just talked about are things within the control of the United States. It's in the control of citizens. It's in control of lawmakers. It's in control of our executive and legislative branch. We have choices to make that could make us a lot safer, regardless of what China is doing and regardless of what the rest of the world is doing. And I think until we start addressing the low hanging fruit, the medium hanging fruit, all of the options that we have at our disposal, it's gonna be really hard for us to show up and make ourselves safe to foreign interference in a digital ecosystem, to make ourselves safe in a cybersecurity attack, to make sure that our digital ecosystem is one that advances the interests of our country at home and abroad and ensures that Americans enjoy the rights uh, and the democracy that we've come to expect. Uh, and so I hope that's not a dodge on disinformation, just to say, I think it's tempting sometimes to focus on this narrow piece, but you can't avoid these bigger questions. And until we really get to the root of these problems, we're gonna continue to have any number of the negative externalities like disinformation uh, that we've talked about today. It's, it's not a dodge, Rose. It's like exactly why you're the perfect person to be part of this conversation is to bring it back to the big picture um, and beat me up when I'm doing it badly. All right. Um, I do want to give um, Rana a, a, a moment to uh, uh, just you know, give us some closing thoughts, and then we're going to uh, hand it over to Barry. Okay, great. Well, thank you for having me as part of this panel. It's been great to hear Richard and Rose, all your thoughts. I, I agree with almost all of them. Um, Rose, I think you actually make the core point, um, which is it's really not about um, uh, curbing China. We're not going to do that. Um, it's about figuring out what kind of an economy and what kind of a society, actually, we want to have here in the U.S. And um, that's why I think antitrust is such a useful uh, starting point for some of these bigger discussions about how to reshape um, shareholder capitalism, how to make sure that you have um, a society and an economy and a market system that functions well, allocates capital efficiency and supports uh, efficiently and supports liberal democracy. And so i um, really happy to be part of this um, and I'll turn it over to Barry. Thank you very much. Um... Ron, thank you, Rose, again, for joining us on your vacation. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard, as well, uh, for bringing in that uh, tech perspective. And um, I want to uh, thank uh, Barry as well for giving uh, us all the opportunity. And uh, Barry, thank you much. Hey, thank you, David. And you know, thank you all. This was a truly excellent conversation, a fundamentally important conversation. You know, a groundbreaking conversation here in Washington, you know, and I think uh, what we, you know, as Rose and as Richard and Ron all made clear, you know, the stakes that we are faced with today, what was at stake is democracy itself, liberal democracy. So um, I think we have the answer to the question that we asked at the beginning of the event today, you know, it does stronger anti-monopoly enforcement, well, is it bad? Is it dangerous for our national security? I think the answer is no. It's a resounding no. In fact, as today's discussion makes clear, Google, Facebook, and Amazon pose many serious, even existential threats to US national security, as well as our democracy. You know, I think General Clark said something earlier. You know, he 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 called out to the corporations, to the executives. He said, you know, it's time to come clean. <laughs> he said, it's time for you guys to cooperate. You know, it is time. It's way past time. You know, because when our national security, when our democracy is at stake, you must cooperate. And, but, you know, let's be clear. If you actually don't come to the table, we're going to drag you there. We're going to fix these problems exactly as we see fit to fix them. 
You know, I want, you know, all of our friends at Google, at Facebook and Amazon, we're coming for you. And that's all of us. That's all the American people, Democrats, Republicans, we're all coming for you. And we're going to drag you down. So um, anyway, we got, this is the good start to a uh, three-day conversation. Uh, we have uh, another conversation tomorrow, uh, which uh, this is part of our three-day conference, Busting the Big Myths of Anti-Monopoly Reform. Tomorrow's discussion will be keynoted by White House Special Assistant Tim Wu, and it's going to address the question of, you know, is anti-monopoly reform bad for innovation and independent business? Thursday's discussion, which will be keynoted by uh, Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust, uh, Jonathan Cantor, is going to look at the question, is anti-monopoly reform bad for consumer privacy and consumer prices? Both of those events will be at noon. Uh, we have all the information on our website uh, at, here at Open Markets. Um, and uh, we hope to see all of you again tomorrow and on Thursday. Uh, I'm Barry Lynn. I'm the Executive Director at uh, Open Markets. And uh, thank everybody for coming today and look forward to seeing you again very soon.